Well, this afternoon, um, we've got the interesting uh, scenario of last week having interviewed Martin Sims, this week interviewing Yvonne Sims. It's kind of like Martin's a little nervous in case Yvonne's just going to correct everything he said, which I don't think is going to happen. But Yvonne and Martin are, uh, have been part of our church for a little while now and a, a delightful couple, really helpful in lots of different ways and very involved in lots of different ways in our church. And Yvonne, it's brilliant to spend some time just talking uh, with you this afternoon. Um, so thank you for being willing to do this. Really good to have you with us. Um, before we go into any of your story in any depth, just give us a headline. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How, if someone said, who are you? How do you, how do you describe yourself? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, I don't like being not busy. I don't like not being involved with things. I'm an involver, I think. Um, I like to, I like to read. I like to listen to audio books. I like to craft. Um, I do all sorts of things, a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, who am I? I try to accept and love people just as they are. I, I don't think it's my place to judge them, who they are, what they are. Um, I think we're just there to love each other and to be there and get alongside each other. And so that's really my, I think, a, a, a gift that God has given me to just love and be with people and, and just try and get alongside them. Um, and I love that because people are so interesting and, and so, yeah, got so much to offer. And, and one of the ways you do that is, is through your, your project, the, the, the food parcels, isn't it? I mean, yeah. that's a very practical, yeah. active demonstration yeah. of what you've just explained. Yeah. Do you want yeah. to just tell people a bit about that? Tell us how it works. Um, the food parcels um, started in 2011, and that was Esther Lane, Hannah Barton and Ian Peacock. And a group of us came together and we started it to reach out to asylum seekers in the beginning. And we work in conjunction with the Red Cross and we have done that, as I say, all the way through. Gradually, people have moved off. Esther and I did it for probably five years together, six years together. And then Esther had other things she wanted to do, which left me and volunteers to continue it on. Uh, Peter at that stage, I think, came back from America, so he got involved as well. And it's grown. It's not huge. Uh, at the height of the pandemic last year, we probably gave out 60 food parcels, which for a little independent food bank is quite a lot. Mm. When you think that I have £200 worth of donations a month to feed 60 people for a month on that is not a lot of money. But with careful buying, and my dear husband, Martin, as he calls himself the logistics, he helps me by going and getting stuff, or we go shopping together. He does the humping around because he won't let me. Um, yeah, so we sort of get the food together. We get it from Fair Share, which is a charity that sells it to you cheap. Uh, it, that comes from supermarkets and is excess lines. During the pandemic, they have given it to us in the beginning free and then has charged us a nominal amount for what we're getting, the second lot we're getting, paid full price for the first delivery, and then we go and collect a second lot. Um, Tesco's gives us the food that would go in the skip that night, on a Tuesday night, and on a Wednesday morning, I go and collect it from another Tesco's. Martin collects Tuesday night. So in that way, we've been able to get enough food together with donations and these charity um, donations have been able to feed and give a reasonable food parcel. We got a grant from CVS for a thousand pound and we gave everybody six eggs because I was worried a tin of tuna is not a, pro not a protein for a week. Mm. It's supposed to be seven pound a parcel of food for a week which yes quite it's nothing i see your eyebrows go up it's mm. nothing nothing 
Um, so, and that's where the, the chickens that we now have came in um, because we, I wanted to supplement to make the thousand pound go longer. Um, but yes, it, it, it's just become a passion. It, we shouldn't be having people hungry in 2020. And it's happening out there. We've got holiday hunger as well, where we feed children every school holiday, uh, give them a packed lunch three days a week. Uh, and again, Booth Charity has supported us there for two years. They came to me the second year and offered us a second grant. And I've been able to add in yogurt into a sandwich, a packet of crisps, a drink and a piece of fruit. So now they have a yogurt as well because I've got money to do it. But we shouldn't be having to feed children in school holidays. No. And even though the grant, they may get vouchers or they may get food from, from the government and from the schools, what we give them means that the other food or the vouchers can go into the family budget and help that out. Mm. So we continue to do it. Um, and both of them are things that I feel passionately should not be happening in 2020, 2021. I think I, I, you're absolutely right. And, it, uh, and it's a shame on the one hand, but to hear your passion for it mm. is invigorating. I mean, there is a sense in which, you know, when I say to you, tell us a little bit about yourself, I, I know, because I know you um, a little, that it's not long before the food parcels is close to your heart because actually, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like there, there, there are two things that are close to your heart. One is your food parcel. One is your allotment, which I know you grow food for the food. For <laughs> <laughs> and on that allotment are some chickens <laughs> and um, they all have their part to play. But it's it's kind of it's it's brilliant to know that within our church, there are people like yourself who go, well, actually, this is an issue we can do our part and it's only a small part perhaps you know you, you talk about it being a small part but for those folk that receive it it's not small and, um... and increasingly english people are coming and that over the years they started coming and they'd knock at the door and say can we have some food mm. and i and I, they would say no no it's just and i said no hang on a minute these people need food let's give it to them and that side has grown as well so now we give almost equal amounts to English or people who would normally, and asylum seekers, and they may be for whatever reason, you know. And that's important, I think, that we don't just, and we don't do anything other than ask them their circumstances. We don't need vouchers, we don't need them yeah. referred. They just come and they know, people get to know that they can just come, talk to us, and we will help them for a month at least while they get the benefits sorted. But they just come. And I think that's important. This voucher system, well, don't even get me started. OK, we've only got a little bit of time. So let's not um, let's not go down that. We'll you, you can talk with Marcus Rashford later or all that. But enough to say that if people want to be uh, supportive of you and support. And people you don't have. Really. Yeah, people have. Great. That's but the interesting thing to me, uh, another interesting thing to me, is that if we were stereotyping people, it would be easy to say, well, Yvonne's a sort of, uh, you know, gets a hand dirty, gets alongside people, helps people practically and all the rest of it. But you're also a person who I know because I, I hear the testimonies, is keenly spiritually aware and and not only believes in but practices the, the you know that sort of the sense of the power of god who who breaks into people's situations to make a radical difference and i know that in many ways this is connected to your own story mm -hmm. about how you came to become a christian in the first place do you want to do you want to explain your background tell us a little bit about your own faith development well when i was very young my parents were spiritless uh, my father was the president of the church in Abingdon, which I was told at a later date was the real McCoy. They really did manage to contact the dead. He was a healer and my mum was a medium. And they used to run um, 
what they call development circles in the lounge when I was in the bedroom, which meant they were training other people to contact the dead, the spirits. Um, when I was about 11, my parents told me about it, and they hadn't until that point because they thought I might be frightened. And at that point, I started going to the church with them. And one time I had an experience which was very weird. Um, I sat there crying, sobbing my heart out, didn't know why. Look at myself thinking, what's going on here? Talked to my mum afterwards and she just said, the woman in front had just lost her husband and I was picking up her grief. Uh, the comment was, I was good mediumistic material, which I have to say I was not happy about. But it was because I could link into other people's feelings that I think they felt that. So I then uh, was at school, I was a teenager, and my RE teacher was a Christian, uh, a born again Christian, and she was talking about different religions and asked about spiritualism. And I put my hand up, then ended up having to talk about spiritualism in the class to the rest of the class. But through that, I actually became a Christian. She shared with me the Bible and what the Bible said about it. And I guess I'd already feeling a bit iffy. When I was very little and we lived in Hounslow, I used to take myself off to the, the Church of England church on a Sunday by myself, you know, when I was old enough to walk around. Um, and I love this idea of a child saying, I'm going to be rebellious. I'm going to go to the Church of England. <laughs> Church exactly. I'm going to rebel against my parents. I'm going to go to the local Anglican church. <laughs> I didn't know at the time. You didn't. So, um, yeah, so obviously there'd been something in me that Jane King brought out. Mm. And so I started going to the local Baptist church with a friend of my mum. And then I ended up going down to, we moved, physically moved my parents. And I ended up going to Harwell Church which was a village, next village down the road. And I got involved with a group that was into the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and renewal and was actually baptised in the Holy Spirit there. And it was after that that I had a very real experience of the clash of the darkness of Satan and the light of Jesus because I came home from work one day couple of days later after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and, and tongues and I was actually sitting on the loo and it was like somebody had put a light flicked a light switch and this fear came over me from head to bottom and I don't know nervous breakdown I don't know what it was but it went on for years and it was horrible I, it was like a black cloud was sitting over my head. Anyway, about at the same time, I started going to the Young People's Bible Study in Harwell, which is where I met Martin. And uh, seven of us got together and uh, different couples and seven couples got married out of that Bible study. So it was obviously very fruitful <laughs> in more ways than one. And uh, we were about 17 at the time, but within a month we knew that we were right for each other. And we then prayed about it and asked the Lord to show us and asked good Christian friends to pray for us and asked the Lord as well for us. And out of that came that it was right that we should get married. And so Martin wanted to be the same age as I was because his mum called me a baby snatcher because he's six months younger than I am but he wanted to be 20 when I was 20 so we waited till we were 20 and got married when we were 20. Um, we were both working in the scientific field. Martin is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Got lots of letters after his name but he wouldn't tell you that. No, he didn't tell us that. Oh, no, no, he wouldn't. No. Um, <laughs> certainly when he was working, he had his business cards with mm -hmm. letters behind his name. Bless him. Um, but I worked in the scientific field. I, would, I worked on a stereo scan, a geo scan. I used to do histology. I did all sorts of stuff in that. And then, of course, I had kids. So we had Peter um, when we'd been married about three, 
uh, 69, uh, we married 69, three years. So we had Peter when we've been married three years. And three years later, we had Angie. Just quickly about Pete. Pete's homosexual and uh, has real mental health issues and can't work because of them. He's not fit for work, they say. Uh, and bless him. But he's a very intelligent, lovely, lovely guy. Love him to bits. And Angie is, was a midwife uh, right up until March last year and now works in focus care, working with pregnant girls, getting them into house. Um, I stayed at home one, in the first few years of their life and then started going back into accounting and doing all sorts of different jobs, working in schools, all sorts of things. We were working in, we were worshipping in a community church um, and then after when that closed down, the people that were leading it decided to close it down. Martin and I ended up going to Christchurch in Abingdon and um, we had been uh, involved in renewal meetings that were very popular at that time. They were different areas and you would have people would come from miles to go mm -hmm. to these, these renewal meetings. But then they decided they were going to close the nettle bed one down. And Martin and I were involved in running a renewal meeting in Abingdon uh, for several years, again, until it was felt that, you know, people needed to take it into their churches. But out of Christchurch, um, we had a deaconess called Bernadette. And Bernadette needed realised that I needed delivering. Um, I just live with it. I just live with all these years of what should have been the happiest years of my life. I just lived with this terrible black depression that would dog me. You know, they say it dogs you and sits on your shoulders. And it was a bit like that. And she took me to somebody called John Warmer, who was the curer of some old dates. And he basically delivered me. Um, I repented of going to the church, repented of disobeying God's laws, and he prayed for me to be cut off from it and be delivered uh, from anything that was causing the um, black cloud, the depression, whatever it was, whatever you like to call it. And from that time on, I'd get depressed, but I'd know why I was depressed, and that black cloud just went. Okay. Let me let me just pause with you for a moment, and I think I, it's interesting. The last that last uh, comment is kind of significant because not all depression, no, is, no, not at all, not at all. needs deliverance, and and you know that's important that people hear what we are what, yeah, what we're saying. Together. Yeah, that's right. And depression is sort of like a a a, 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 a banner word for a lot of things. Yeah. But but what do you think was going on with yourself? You know, you, you, you talked about you know growing up in your family, this this family that was deeply rooted in spiritualism. And then once you'd become a Christian, in a sense, I don't know whether people might have expected once you you know, as you're telling your story going forward, you sort of say, Well, I became a Christian, I got baptized in the spirit. And the next sentence should be <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was brilliant. But for you, it wasn't. So what do you think was going on? I remember that I was at home this yeah. before I met Martin. Um, and I was living in a house which was actively inviting spirits into it. My parents were having meetings in the lounge with their friends from the spiritualist church. I wasn't involved with them. But I was in a situation where demonic powers, as we would see it, were invited into the house. And of course, I became a Christian. I was then baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was like, what? We're not going to have this. Okay. We're going to do everything we can to stop this person going on or this girl going on with God, with Jesus. And for me, it was depression, it was fear, so much fear, probably fear more than depression, but it was fear that's, that, that just covered me mm. over everything. I was even scared to go away on holiday. 
I mean, Martin probably never really realised that because I just got on with it. But I was frightened of my own shadow, as they say. Yeah. And this fear was overwhelming. And to me, it was the world of, of, of Jesus, God's world and Satan's world clashing. And Satan was saying, this girl is not going to go on. With it's sister. interesting because your dad, who was, um, you know, held responsibility for the church, he'd warned you, hadn't he? Oh, yeah. About, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, from his perspective, I mean, he was fully involved with it and fully, you know, yeah. signed up to it all. But he'd warned you about that this is a dangerous world of yeah. of, of spirits of, of the occult, what we would call the occult, really, hadn't you? Yeah, that you could contact good or bad spirits and that you needed to be very aware and to do it in a very safe way. Now, how you do that in a safe way, I don't know. If you're summoning spirits up, who knows who who's going to come but obviously my father although he didn't go into it obviously had a had experience sure. of bad things happening through contacting they thought the dead but obviously we know they're they're spirits so um, so once you've been prayed, yeah so once you've been prayed with um with with the curates and all this that that then you, you you noticed a difference you noticed a, a freedom oh, yeah the fear when that awful crippling fear that had been with me all that time the sort of as i can only describe it like a black cloud over me it it just clouded everything that happened for me and that just went and yes if i'd get down about something or i'd feel depressed i would know it was because a we didn't have enough money yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's yeah, it was, it, normal it, it, every life. Yeah, yeah. Everything. yeah. Did, did, you manage, did you manage to <clears throat> retain a relationship with your mum and dad? I mean, you know, how did your mum and dad respond to you? Well, in the sense, you was, it, they must have almost thought that you were rejecting. It's easy for the, for parents if if their children don't follow the same belief patterns for faith for yeah. them to think they're rejecting them. I mean, how did your parents react to you? Yeah, very much so. Um, one of the things I did, and rightly or wrongly, um, I didn't think they'd listen to me, so I wrote them a letter, and I just wrote them a letter saying, I, I felt I had to make a stand. And so I wrote them a letter just giving them the gospel, telling them what the Bible said about it, and basically saying, I'm frightened for your salvation. They went berserk, and they went to my oldest sister, and after that was a very very difficult few years um yeah we can maintain a relationship but it was very distant my parents were very loving spiritualist people are very often very loving spiritualist churches are very loving places to be my parents were amazing they were always befriending lonely people um and having them home um and they were lovely people but there was this distance and this discord between us for about 10 years, black sheep of the family is how I've described it. Um, that's how it felt um, until we were able to have a conversation and I could say to them, look, mum, dad, I did it because I love you so much. You know, we've always been there for <laughs> each other as a family. And I love you so much that I wanted you to know what I believe is the truth. And I'm sorry it's upset you. But... And after that, our relationship went back to more or less normal, except that I wouldn't go to their church. I wouldn't go to my father's funeral, which is another story. Um, and that sort of has caused problems at the latter days. But then the rest of the family wouldn't have gone either. So we wouldn't go and get involved with Freemason, um, Freemasonry and their ladies' nights and things like that. So they didn't understand any of this. And I'm all I'm I'm the religious maniac of the family, and always have been, probably always will be. <laughs> but one of the things that, and, and maybe not surprisingly, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, is important to you, and one of the things the Lord has used you with, is then being able to pray with other people, and and see God God work quite you know remarkably. And I think, yeah, yeah just explain some of that. Tell us a little bit. I think I needed quite a lot of healing myself, and the way the Lord showed me 
was to actually just ask the Holy Spirit, what needs sorting? And so out of that came um, uh, praying with people and what I would call prayer healing, where we would ask the Holy Spirit to come. The person who you're praying for would always be in control, but praying for them and asking the Lord to show us. And sometimes it would be a verse, sometimes it would be pictures, be something they would think about. And then we would pray into whatever it was the Lord had shown. I've had quite a lot of experience of praying with people that have been involved in the occult and seeing people delivered from that, who very similar to me have suffered in, in oppressed ways. Oppressed is the word, perhaps, yeah. rather than depression, oppressed ways. And because of my experience, because of my having to fight the the powers that were in my home life, I've learned to pray and I've learned to know in the power of Jesus and what he did on the cross and that his power is overall. And yeah, over the years of, I, I have prayed with people in this way and seen them released, especially when there have been involvement in, in occultic things in some way or other. It's a good reminder of, um, I, I, I suppose what I'm thinking as I'm, I'm listening to you is there's, there's something that's a really good reminder about the holistic care that God offers us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? People need to be fed. <laughs> People who don't have enough money need a helping hand. And you don't get much more practical than and we got some chickens who lay some eggs egg. <laughs> here's an egg i produced earlier um and that's very <clears throat> that's easy I, I, it's not easy but it's 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 easy to see it's clear to see but i think also people need to know the spiritual freedom to live wholeheartedly before god yeah and I think God offers us both. It's not either or. Yeah. And I think to be able to hold that together just seems to be really precious um, and, and significant for us as individuals and as a church and, and as a community so that when we are meeting people with their own stories, we're able to go, okay, well, maybe out of our experience together, we, we know how we can respond. And sometimes God will show you something about a person, but that, not necessarily when you're praying with them, but that's not necessarily for you to then go and say to this person, but no. it may be just for you to pray. Yeah. And I, I, I truly believe that, you know, we need to hear God's truth because God's truth is the thing that sets us free. Yeah. And that may be that you do that, as a, I would never pray with somebody necessarily by myself. I would always try and have it as a threesome at least. But I, um, I, I, I believe that it's either to pray, you know, Lord, how do I pray? This is where the gift of tongues is, as we talked about in one of the evening things, is so important to me, is simply because if I don't know how to pray and I can't hear God saying pray this way, then I will pray in tongues because I know God knows what that person needs. Mm. And so I will pray in tongues for that situation because I know in praying in tongues, then I know that God is praying for what needs to happen in that person's life or for that person or in that person's spirit, healing, whatever. But it is holistic. Mm. Yeah. If only we could talk and talk and talk. But thank you for being willing just to tell us a little bit of your story. I know there's much more, but it's enough for us to hear the, I, I think, I, I want to say, suggest it's, it's the beating heart of God for people. I think it is. I think it's the beating heart of people um, who are trapped. Yeah. Trapped in poverty, trapped by um, forces beyond their own understanding yeah. sometimes yeah. That, that just get them into a, a cul-de-sac and they can't seem to get out of it yeah. 
but but the beating heart for God is is, is for freedom, and um, and I, I think it's great to hear how you know that's happened for you, but also how then we can live hopefully for others. Yes, yeah. Set people free to do the work that God had ordained them to do. Yeah. yeah. Is my mission statement, if you like. That's not a bad mission statement to have. Yvonne, thanks ever so much for your time. You're welcome. All right. You're welcome.